Some teach, teachings talk about the inherent, inherent Buddha nature in beings. Other focus on um, the teachings about the constant stream of consciousness with an emphasis on dependent arising. How should we reconcile these? Well, um, Buddha nature is, as far as I, I see this, Buddha nature is just that you can get fully enlightened, that it's open for everybody. It's basically that. Um, uh, um, and then other people are focusing on the constant stream of consciousness with an emphasis on dependent arising. Uh, maybe I misunderstand the idea of Buddha nature. What is Buddha nature? Is I mean, that... I think in the Theravada sense, we would see it the way you described okay, it. But I Mahayana? think in the Mahayana, I mean, I don't know enough about Mahayana philosophy, but I do think there's more of a sense of something in there that's eternal and that's kind oh, okay. of... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That might last. How can you reconcile this? Well, that is... If, if, if this... Um, if, if the, the um, definition of the nature is like in some traditions uh, of this um, ultimate um, being um, then the problem here is that it's a different teaching so in, as I can see it today basically you can't reconcile them <laughs> that, that's my opinion because you can read old texts and it, this is um, uh, this is one of the issues that our society here in Norway is very focused on, because in all traditions uh, there is a common source of teachings, and they exist in Pali and exist in Sanskrit, and they are in Zen meditation, they are in Theravada meditation uh, tradition, they are in Tibetan uh, Buddhism. And, the, and there are actually now professors and people doing comparative studies about those old teachings, and they are so much the same. The problem, yeah, I think it's a problem, is that various traditions have added new layers and new books and new ideas on top of these teachings which we all have in common. And then after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, some tradition tends to forget or drown all the teachings, the original teachings of the Buddha, and they just focus on some newer ideas, which uh, exists uh, in a commentarial literature, maybe written a thousand years, fifteen hundred years after the Buddha. And it is true that many of those um, texts, the ideas which are um, presented there, they are different. They basically redefined. Buddhism, and I can't, I can't see that, uh, uh, I, I can't see any re reconcil or reconciliation there, because it's just something new. And if people want to focus on that, okay, it's not that it's necessarily wrong, all those new ideas coming up, but it's not from the Buddha. And so often I can see that those teachings coming later, there are some nuances or there are some differences which is different from the old teachings. So just be aware of this when you read and when you listen to teachers and where are they coming from, what are they focusing on, because there are differences, there are big differences. And you then just have to choose what you want to listen to. I came, I ended up uh, with in this uh, Thai forest tradition and that's a tradition which is famous for basically going back to the oldest teaching and practicing them and basically just leave behind a bit the newer kind of books and newer ideas and, and try to practice that part. And I see a lot of people having really good results 
in, in that kind of, of practice in the old, we call it early Buddhism in our society. Uh, so just be aware of that. There are differences out there and you just have to figure out what you want to put your trust into. And there are ideas there which I cannot re uh, uh, reconcile. They're basically too, too different. Oh, this is chunky. There's a poem. <laughs> this is really sweet. With the Venerables at Venabu. <laughs> That's already cool, isn't yeah. it? That's just the first line, I think. With the Venerables at Venabu, just south of Mystic Mountain. Moo. Our minds laid bare as books with wear with no page pointing to you. Wow. In our mind there forms a cue, aggregates all in different hue. Do not fear, you can bear, as distortions dissipate like dew. Wow. <laughs> With skillful means and views more true, among the things we hear in view, Stay right here, mend books with care, and see your shelf near Mountain Moo. <laughs> That's really cool. Ha! Huh. I might answer a question too. Maybe you want to keep that too. Yeah, I probably would. Yeah. Can we make a, I might uh, also keep it and put it on my newsletter <laughs> with permission. <laughs> it's really cute. I'm not sure what Moo is, but it sounds cool. Huh? Who oh, is it? It's one of the mountains. Moo. Oh, yeah, that's oh. a pointy one, isn't it? Oh, yeah. beautiful. Oh. What is the difference between Pamoja, Piti, and Sukha? <laughs> yeah, well, hmm. These are different words, and the sequence into Samadhi would suggest that they sort of have different flavors, but honestly, they are words, so our experience is always going to be different from maybe what we read in the books and maybe from what another person might describe as joy or rapture or sukha. Um, to me, I guess pomoja, the joy, is something that can come up, I mean piti as well, but pomoja is probably more related to kind of everyday life in a sense or the preliminary kind of joy and uplift of maybe generosity or virtue gratitude um more kind of um, if you like worldly or everyday emotions that you can have in your daily life as well as on the cushion and it seems to me that pt is usually related to rapture that arises through meditation and that arises through um, starting to have some continuity with your object. So you're actually staying with the meditation object for a, a certain period of time and the longer you can stay the more this PT arises. So some people actually translate it as rapt interest. So it's like rapture but it's, as Ajahn Brahm says, something that kind of keeps you with your object. It sticks the mind to the breath or it kind of helps the mind soak into the breath because it's something um, that has that element of interest in it. So it's a little bit more subtle, I would say, and there are different types of PT. Um, again, there must be more than this, but in the commentaries, uh, they talk about, I think in the Visuddhimagga, they talk about like momentary PT, which is maybe just like a sort of flash of kind of goosebumps or something like this. Um, showering, uh, uplifting, I think. Somebody today said they feel like they're lifting up, like with this lightness, this sense of buoyancy. Um, what else? It can be like a flash. But the longer you stay with it and the more sustained it becomes, then it can also be quite quiet. It can also be quite subtle. And the kind of, um, what I consider, slightly agitating kind of um, mm, vibration, if you like, of it, or the kind of slightly... Mm, rousing element starts to quieten and PT and sukha usually go together but you start to get more in touch with the 
kind of the pleasantness of it, the kind of sweetness, if you like, or I think of it as kind of mellow, like sukkah is a bit more mellow, maybe a bit more contented, more uh, mm, more settled even than the, the PT. So PT then seems relatively coarse, but they actually go together right up until I think the third jhana. So PT and sukkah are actually together and it's very hard to distinguish. Um, but sometimes I just play with distinguishing momentarily in my practice just to see for me, usually the PT manifests first in the body, whereas sukkah seems more related to the mind. But that might be just my own kind of interpretation. I'm not sure there's really anything valid in that. So, yeah, you can explore for yourself and just treat them as different flavors and different sort of frequencies, if you like, that are there in the mind, but that are increasingly subtle in a way and also increasingly um, nourishing. Increasingly nourishing. The sukkah is more um, quenching for the mind. So you can really relax into it and then it becomes kind of, I guess, smooth and trustworthy. PT is a little bit more um, jumpy, perhaps. I don't know. We all probably experience these in different ways. But a uh, nice question. Anyway. We actually, um, the last weekend, we were actually discussing the same thing about Pamuja and yeah. Pitya uh -huh. And we actually came to the situation, we were kind of wondering how we translate Pamuja. Mm. And what word, uh, in English, mm -hmm. which is the best word you have found for Pamuja? I prefer joy. And then rapture yeah. for Piti and something like yeah. pleasure or contentment yeah. for Sukha. Yeah, yeah, gladness yeah. is good too. Yeah. Pamuja is basically this, um, if we behave ethically yeah. and we are just in our behavior, uh, kind of speech and body, if we are a kind person, it creates, it does something to your mind. It creates this, what the Buddha called for Pamuja. Yeah, you can say it gladdens the mind. Yeah, gladness gl yeah, is yeah, quite yeah. good because it's yeah. a verb as well. Yeah. It makes the mind joyful, but yeah, yeah gladdens. Gladness. Yeah. It's it's difficult to find words or yeah. terms. And they often come together. Like if there's gladness in the mind, there might be pity along with it, right? There might be pleasure along with it. But I think pity and sukha are more specific to actual meditation. Yeah. Uh, how do we strike a balance between right effort and our soft on our self-proclaimed contentment. Ooh, um, okay, right effort, at least um, in a for path, is about um, stopping the arising of unwholesome mental states and the creation of beautiful mental states in our mind. That's right effort. And a self-proclaimed contentment. Self-contentment. Self-proclaimed contentment. Contentment is at least uh, not wanting anything, so just uh, no craving. Um, so how do you check a balance between those? Uh, I don't see any. You know, you can do both. Balance. Do you need to balance them? I don't think you need to balance them. Maybe in this it sense it can be that that um, your mind is maybe distracted or it's active and you just want instead of kind of doing right effort, you just want to be content with whatever it is. Now it's kind of active, or now it's kind of negative, and you don't want to do anything about it. You don't want to do any right effort. And so when do you just let it be and be happy with it? And when do you actually start to practice the sixth factor of the Eightfold Path? And you try to turn things around. So that might be an interpretation of this, this question. And, and, uh, and a balance,
I don't know. <laughs> really. You can do both. Do you have any? I think if it's really contentment, it is a wholesome state. So I think if it's true contentment, that is one of the... It is. You've accomplished right effort. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful wholesome states. So if it's really contentment, I think that is already enough. You don't need to do anything at that point. But if it's kind of, oh, well, I'll just put up with this negative state. Oh, these really terrible thoughts are coming in, but I'll just kind of let them be, then that's not really contentment. That's like um, a sort of very dull mindfulness without what the Buddha calls a gatekeeper, which is supposed to be like a bouncer on the door that keeps out the kind of um, the enemies. So there's a place for observing like unwholesome thoughts or unwholesome states, but the observation needs to be very uh, wholesome, and only if the observation has wholesome qualities in it can it kind of overcome the unwholesome states. If it's just neutral, or if it's just too passive, then those habits will continue. So, but you can infuse contentment into the, into the way you're aware, and that will prevent those unwholesome states from staying too long, because contentment then becomes what you're aware of. That's at least in my experience, but tomorrow's talk will explain it even better than that. but yeah you might be right that it's a different um, uh, meaning of contentment that that person's using there I I think that it's just that there are activities in the mind Mm. and they just want to don't do anything about it and just maybe maybe like embrace it and just let it be Mm -hmm. and not do anything with it versus actually going in and actively trying to kind of fix it up somehow and when you let it be so it kind of just, just disappears by itself. Right. And when do you kind of go in there and apply mm-hmm. some methods or do something to, to kind of yeah. change it? This is actually the question, isn't it, in a way of meditation? <laughs> like, how much do we kind of get involved? And I think this yeah, is, yeah. in a way, something we're working with in every meditation session. And it's so different from time to time. Like, there's no kind of, sorry about that, right answer that's going to be like, right, this is the exact balance you know between the two it's like a constant adaptation to whatever's happening like you're constantly kind of shifting and responding and experimenting too so you know there's nothing you have to get right really it's a process of experimentation i can maybe say that um if you try if you, if there are kind of mental states which are you kind of perceive as negative or unwholesome and you just, first you try, okay, I'll just let it be. i just be content with that my mind is kind of negative now. But if that just continues, mm-hmm. it goes on and on and on and on and on, and you give it a try, and it just continues, then maybe you can change. Then maybe you can, okay, let's apply something here. So, uh, uh, so it kind of changes to something better. Mm. One more comment on that, um, because it's really interesting as a whole talk. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's great, you know, kind of first trying the contentment, trying the least effort first, but another way, and then, you know, applying antidotes. Another way is to also develop wholesome states first. You know, like start with metta or start with uh, whatever you think is a negative state, start with the antidote at the beginning of the practice, and then also you can just um, set the tone, if you like, of the mind. And then gradually let go more and more. So yeah, different ways, I think. But certainly yeah. if you're going to go into something really negative, like negative speech that could harm another person or unwholesome action, then you need to pl- apply antidotes and restraint. Mm. Yeah. 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 So I think that's the best we can do <laughs> in answering this question today. Maybe actually we get some uh, perspective on this tomorrow when you listen to the talk about John Brown. Mm-hmm. But he is because that talk is just about that. Like we, we are aware of our mind and there are things going on mm-hmm. and how can we be just be uh, at peace with that? So maybe there will be a second answer tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> hmm. 
<laughs> that sounds like a difficult question. <laughs> I don't know how much I can personally speak to this. Is Nibbana the same as cessation? And is that the goal? Or is it a final means to insight into emptiness? Hmm, I think it's both. <laughs> I think it's both. When there's insight into emptiness, and you see what's causing the, uh, let's say, not, insight into emptiness is not quite the way I'd put it. Because emptiness is not a thing. Like the way that emptiness is described in the suttas is an emptiness of something. Something is empty of something. Emptiness is not a state, it's not a thing. You can't observe emptiness. But you can see that, for example, these five components of existence, the body, the perception, the feelings, the, ve the uh, consciousness, um, or else the reactions, and everything we take to be a self is empty of anything permanent. It's empty of something. It isn't emptiness, because that would be something. But it's empty of any kind of permanence. And that's an important difference, yeah. It could be from Zen, yeah, it could be from Zen. I mean, I'm going to be speaking from my understanding of the suttas and the practice as I sort of um, have approached these things. Um, and I don't know exactly what in Zen people might mean as emptiness. Um, one way into understanding it is to see conditionality, so to see that everything arises and passes and again that just means there's nothing inherent there's nothing essential there's no real um, essence there so in that sense it's empty or you could call that emptiness I would call it conditionality because it's not enough just to see there's nothing really there it's more important to understand how things arise and pass it's not just that things are impermanent it's how they arise and how they cease, it's causality as well. Does that make sense? I mean, this is pretty deep, and I mean, I haven't experienced Nibbana, so I can't actually tell you. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, from my understanding of the suttas and from talking a lot to people who I trust have experienced these things, um, Nibbana, as we you know, experience it while we're still alive, um, is the realisation that everything can completely cease and will completely cease at the end of this life. And uh, the word Nibbana actually means, uh, it was used to mean a flame going out, so a flame nibutos, um, it, it Nibbanas when it's, uh, when it's gone. And in one sutta, I forget where it is, but somewhere in the Majjhima, the Buddha actually makes this quite funny, I think it's in the Majjhima Nikaya, Ta'agi Vesana, I think. And they say, oh, where does a, a, um, a person go after Parinibbana? And the Buddha says, like, where does a flame go? You know, can you say that a flame's gone to the north or to the south? No, <laughs> it hasn't gone anywhere. It's not going to be reborn in this realm of happy little flames. It's just going to go out when the fuel for the flame's continuation ceases. So I see it as a process of gradual cessation, and we can see that in our meditation, right? We can see when things start to fade, and then eventually cease completely. Sometimes we experience the breath ceasing, or at least it seems that it ceased. It's probably not unless you enforce jhana, but <laughs> it ceased from your awareness, right? Sounds might have ceased, your body might have ceased. So we can see things ceasing, and we can see that in their place is much more happiness. And that's the real trick. So you know that this gradual process of things fading is a, is a process of beautiful things, replacing them, if you like. And they're increasingly subtle, increasingly refined. So you can't really say there's something. But it doesn't really matter what you call it. You just know that this is a path towards something very beautiful, a lot of peace, a lot of happiness, that's beyond this realm of conditioned arising. It's beyond conditions. At first you'll just experience, uh, even in your own practice life, that you're less affected by conditions. You're more stable and centred and... Uh, a peace with the changes that happen to your body, that happen in your life. 
So, um, yeah. Is it the goal or is it a final means? Right, so I suppose it's kind of, yeah. Well, it is the goal because that's the end of it. So that is the end. The end of suffering. Right, isn't that pretty cool? I, I can just add one, one thing, just commentary. Because um, when people talk about cessation, then people start to get afraid. <laughs> what do you mean? Cessation? And then, but, the, but that's just that's one word, one way of putting it. It also means freedom, just as she was trying to say. Cessation means that there is something which disappears. And what is disappearing is suffering. So it is increasing freedom, and even more important, importantly, it is uh, something which you experience, and something which you will value as better. So this, this, the whole Buddhist teaching is about something you do, something you experience, and based on that you, you progress. And you progress because you, you, you basically you cease suffering, and you find more happiness, and you find more freedom. And that more freedom you will perceive on your own, based on your own experience, as better. And then you will gradually kind of um, gravitate in that direction because you found something which is better. That's a much nicer kind of angle on this word cessation. Because cessation, then people really start to kind of make love thoughts and getting negative and they don't really understand and they don't have the experience and then people get afraid. But there's nothing to be afraid of. It's just better and better and better. <laughs> um, if, if, if someone experienced Nirvana before they die, yeah. in this lifetime, yeah. how, how would they don't know they experience it if, if it's Everything is ceasing. Uh, they will know it afterwards. They don't know while they <laughs> they don't know while they experience experiences it, but they will know afterwards that about that experience, and they will know afterwards that that state is better than like the previous states. So they recall what happened. Yes they will recall that kind of experience afterwards and they will perceive that as a higher degree of freedom but how would, they, higher... right. yeah. how would they remember what happened? <laughs> <laughs> because it has the biggest impact on their life yeah. than anything so far <laughs> you, so it, it, when they it, come it, out of that yeah. they'll realize that something has ceased and that something is the defilement so they'll be aware, not immediately, but they'll be aware over time that these things just aren't there anymore. Yeah. So, for example, with stream winning, you'll be aware. You might think you've got stream winning and people can be wrong about it, but if you kind of wait, you know, over time and you check yourself out, you check your mind out, after a while you realise that there's no more wrong view. Your view has changed, like there's been a paradigm shift. You can no longer take something that's impermanent as permanent, something that's non-self as self. You just don't see it the same way anymore. And there's no more doubt, there's unshakable confidence. Yeah? So, in the same way, I think, with every experience of Nibbana, like when more fetters disappear, you will know that those fetters have disappeared. Because it informs your life and how you view everything. I can also add that it... Like when, when we do this training, we, we start by kind of ceasing or kind of removing what's unwholesome. So by doing that, it kind of, there's an improvement of your mind. All the hate and all the negativity, etc. Um, and then what we do develop is like um, positive emotions, like joy, pitisuka, rapture, etc. And that we kind of really um, emphasize. So to really get strong in our mind. And that kind of increases our perception of happiness. So it's kind of even better. So you go from a mind which is kind of negative, 
and then you remove that, and then you make it even better by creating wholesome qualities. And you bring that all the way to deep meditation. And what Chanda said, like third jhana, that's when actually this beautiful feeling starts to cease. And in fourth jhana, you don't have these feelings of um, kind of joy, rapture anymore. And then what you will get further on down the path is freedom. It's not um, feelings anymore, but it is something which you will perceive as better. It's even better than ultimate bliss. Ultimate freedom will be perceived as even better. And that goes on and on and on and on, all the way to jhana. Hey, sorry, nibbana. So we start by removing all the kind of the thing we don't like in our mind. And then we add a lot of good stuff, wholesome uh, states. And we take that, we use that as a means to go really deep. And from there on, they fade away, and we achieve states of freedom. And all the way is a perception of better. You will experience this, and you will know it yourself. It's better and better and better and better. That's what we do. That's a big kind of perspective. Just to add to that, because it's important, and not only it's better, it's more, you're, you are more ethical. This is very important, <laughs> because sometimes people have experiences, but they feel good, you know, but they come back and their behavior is just the same. Um, <laughs> I mean, I have actually met people that profess to, and I do believe that they have experience of really deep meditation, but because of some other issues, they actually haven't got it together in terms of their sila in everyday life. So that means they haven't actually um, gone to the depth where they've actually created a change in that person's mind. So, I mean, the way you can know Nibbana from just any old experience is the change it creates in, in the person. The way they view the world differently, the way they behave, like they'll be full of loving kindness and compassion in a way that you've never really experienced from anyone else before. Uh, so these things are also, you know, if you're looking from the outside anyway, you know, to wonder whether somebody's experienced something like that, then uh, look for the really high virtue and a lot of compassion and understanding that they should have into the nature of life and existence and yeah, suffering as well. Yeah. Okay, next question. It's my turn, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Why is there an emphasis on specific teachers in Buddhism? Should there not be a universal aluminum? Curriculum? <coughs> Probably something like that. Basically, a universal kind of teachings. Um, so, why is there emphasis on specific teachers? Like, we are talking about Ajahn Brahma, Ajahn Brahma, Ajahn Brahma. <laughs> so, is there emphasis, why is there emphasis on, the emphasis on that? It's because it helps us so much. And we kind of, we should, he can kind of help others as well, and we can try to help you as well. Uh, and, and also that, you know, that there are lots of kind of spiritual um, people or seekers <laughs> who develop themselves. And it's, it's not all that many who goes really far. Even amongst the monastics. A lot of them are really trying, doing really well, and they get some really nice progress. But there isn't really that, this is my opinion mm -hmm. at least, there isn't, any, there isn't that many people who have done, they've gone a really long way. And then it we kind of ends up with just a few people who a lot of people think has gone a long way, so that those few ones get a lot of attention. And I think that's the reason why, why uh, there's a specific teachers who get a lot of uh, attention, because there isn't all that many. And should there be like an universal curriculum? There is. 
And that's this uh, um, oldest text we have in Sanskrit and Pali, the oldest ones. We call it early Buddhism, the suttas or the sutras, etc. They are there for everybody in all traditions. I won't make a habit of adding, but just to say, <laughs> some teachers that are well known, uh, wrongly well known, so be careful yeah, yeah. <laughs> and check it by the suttas because there are some kind of famous scallywags in. I know Sri Lanka, as you told me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people who kind of profess to be fully enlightened, you have to suspect it. If somebody claims that, then it's not really true. No. I'm finding myself more anxious as the week goes on in my body and my mind. Any advice on how to work with this would be very helpful. Ajahn Brahm is going to give you such good advice tomorrow in that talk. It's going to really change everything because it's all about how you approach it, how you embrace it, whether you're judging it or whether you're being compassionate to it. So it's okay that that's happening. I mean, most probably this is some old pattern that is coming up for you to um, experience with mindfulness and wisdom and it's offering you an opportunity to make peace. It's offering you an opportunity to embrace it. Because we have to embrace all kinds of emotions on this path. And at some point, if you've not experienced it yet, you will. I was never an anxious pers person, right? But then I started getting perimenopause. And I, sorry, guys, you just don't understand. <laughs> I was having full-on anxiety attacks. And I could see that they were physiological. It was like something in my body was caving in on me out of the blue. I could be talking to poor old Ajahn Brown. One minute, just normally like this. And then suddenly I was just in tears. And he's looking at me like, actually kind of cool, you know. like, <laughs> But kind of thing, it was happening. And I'm like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> and it was entirely physiological. So for all the women here, I'm sure a lot of you tried this. But if you take a few hormones, <laughs> just a little bit, it goes away. It's amazing. <laughs> So is that me and my anxiety problem or is that something else that's just caused by certain chemicals in the body? I mean, in this case, it could be caused by all kinds of things and the Buddha didn't really say go to, you know, the real root cause because it could be anything, right? It could be past trauma, it could be that your meditation is getting deep and you're feeling a little bit like unsure because you're entering new terrain or it could be perimenopause, I don't know. This might be a guy who's written it and then you can rule that out. But, um, yeah, basically we work with everything in the same way, with a lot of peace and care. <laughs> I don't know why it's funny, but it's good that, you know, it is, because I think nobody speaks about this, and being a monastic, I get to do that, so to break the taboo. But uh, it's really interesting for me to have experienced that, because in the past I might have judged other people, you know? Thinking, oh my, what's wrong with their practice? They're supposed to be a good meditator, and they're collapsing. <laughs> Yeah, we judge, right? Because we don't understand. So it's really great when we can have these experiences because if we can make peace with our own anxiety, we then can hold space for others who have anxiety too. And we can be a really good friend to them who's not judgmental, who's listening, who knows how to hold space. So we're learning how to do that and I'm really glad that that talk's coming tomorrow. <laughs> Could you please translate to English what you are singing for us before every lunch? I um, actually did that last the retreat. Um, and I can do that, um, I can bring that translation tomorrow and read it up. I don't have it here. It's basically just thank you. And <laughs> giving you all the best. <laughs> strength and long life and happiness yeah. and all that and stuff. And beauty. Yeah, be beauty as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think the core was that are you wonders who come balam? And are you is like long life. May you live long. Are you one no is like beauty? Yeah. Are you wonders who come is happiness and balam is like strength. But that's what we're wishing you. Every day. 
Uh, okay. Yeah, so. Thank you, Manchenda, for using an inclusive language in your teachings regarding gender equality and LGBTQIA+. <laughs> yes, um, I can't really thank you for thanking me and I can't take credit for it. I just know how it feels to be marginalised since being a bikini, basically. And I want to be sure not to do the same to others. So I think it's very important that we include everybody and use gender-inclusive language. I might not always do it, I might forget, but I do try my best and it sort of stands out to me um, when that isn't the case. So I think it's something we can all try to do just to show that sensitivity <coughs> and welcome. It's not just we want to include people, we want to like celebrate them, right? We want to celebrate everybody for being exactly who they are, whether they're the same as the next person sitting next to them or they're different on the outside, on the inside, however that may be. Um, yes. I'm glad you appreciate it, and I will continue to try to do that. And I think I'll take one more, because that was not really a question. Thank you for the talk on... Oh, sense restraint. I have found that for most senses, it is possible with some mindfulness to detach or wait when they are disagreeable. Very good. However, for nose contact or smells, when the smell is disagreeable... I find it very difficult to stay or wait. The wish for it to disappear is stronger than for disagreeable sensations of other senses. Any advice on that? Thank you. Um, well, I could say go and live in um, India. There you, get a, <laughs> there you get a lot of practice, not only with unpleasant smells, but just with smells in general. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not saying that in a condescending... I love that country. It's my spiritual home, and I lived there for the best part of 15 years. So... <laughs> but uh, the main point, really, about um, uh, learning to work with the senses is to know what triggers us and to know where that aversion is coming from. So it's good that you're noticing that one particular sense is more difficult than maybe others. Um, I don't know if it's really true. I mean, if it was a choice between smelling something disgusting or having your arm cut off, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are sort of successive degrees. Sorry, I'm in a funny mood now. Um, <laughs> and also words is difficult, isn't it? Like what we hear, you know? Like somebody says, I love you, and it's your lover, or it's somebody that you love too. Oh, you feel so good, you feel so valued. Somebody else who's stalking you says it, and oh, this is terrible. You feel really anxious. And <laughs> so words also have a massive impact. But um, yeah, the wish for it to disappear is stronger than the disagreeable sensations of other senses. Um, notice it's impermanence, I guess, because the thing about smell is it's really quite um, very impermanent, I hope, unless there's something going on in the corner of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's just about making peace with these things. And in that sort of today, it spoke a lot about noticing their impermanent nature. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> laughing there. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that's enough. We've still got a lot of questions. It'd be nice to get through them, but um, yeah. good to notice that. And we only have five minutes left. Yeah, so we, can, just... we can speak fast like this. <laughs> Uh, does the progress in meditation depend on personal uh, characteristics? For example, it is easy to achieve progress for calm and silent people uh, than active and sociable ones. Um, well, then maybe for meditation, this 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 uh, if the first. The spiritual kind of training is more than meditation. Meditation is this thing that we we kind of calm down our mind and build um, uh, joy, happiness. But there's also wisdom to be developed. Um, so when it comes to this first part of meditation, um, it might actually be easier for them. If they are like an East, if they, they are like by nature, or by birth, or just they are kind, they are silent, they are uh, they don't uh, uh, they're kind of joyful somehow naturally. And I, we talked today. I talked to, to one person about just about this because they 
we all come into this life and then um, in Buddhism we have lived before. There are previous existences and you can bring characteristics from previous lives into this life. So for example if you for example you've gone all the way and been a monastic in previous life and you've been so silent and and just living by yourself and meditating a lot and trying to develop kind of beautiful mental states and then game over for that body and then here we go again go into kindergarten and school <laughs> and then you grow up and then all these tendencies now all this history just comes back to you and you kind of uh, uh, inherit a lot of the kindness and the peace and, and the joy from past lives. So we, we have different um, uh, baggage, both in <coughs> this life and even in previous lives. And if you have a lot of good karma, a lot of good action, a lot of good training, it's easier. I, and I, I think it's, uh, there is this uh, story I do it from the time of the Buddha. There was this, uh, uh, I think it was a queen, uh, who visited the Buddha once, and just by listening to the Buddha once, according to, uh, as far as I know, she managed to get all the way into full, full awakening. So she had a lot of practice, a lot of development in the past, and then things are much easier now. It's like you've been training a lot. So I think yes. For some people it is easier. And it's, but it's not a coincidence. I think it's because you have been over a long time in developing. And if it's easier for you today, today than for others, it's maybe because you've done a good job in the past. So I think yes. Personal characteristics can make it easier to progress. But there's a long story behind. And they're not fixed. Yes. Because they're changing all the time. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's actually in the end yeah. the same, I think. Mm. Okay. Another one? Last one. All right. In meta meditation, Usually it's really hard for me to get a hold of feelings of love, appreciation, etc. for loved ones. However, yesterday I unexpectedly imagined their loss. Uh, another word in brackets. And I was overflowing with sadness, but also gratitude and love because they are well. I think probably what you're saying is you imagine they're lost, but it was, there's something in brackets there, I think it probably means that um, it wasn't really, does it actually say funeral? I think so. So you imagine their loss, like probably that either they lost someone or that you lost them, and suddenly you were overflowing with sadness, but also gratitude and love, because they are well. Is this weird or something to work with? A niche? <laughs> well, it's certainly a niche. A niche means uh, impermanent, so everything is. Um, nothing's weird, you know. Quite often people come to interviews and whatever, and quite often the question is, is this normal? Which is understandable. But um, basically anything that arises has to arise because the cause was there for it to arise. So everything is normal. Everything is... Um, part of this whole process and that's your creativity coming into play so I don't know maybe that's a nice reflection I mean I've not tried that myself but it comes <clears> to <throat> you spontaneously so I think sometimes you know the mind is very creative and spontaneous and we can trust it to a certain extent I mean if you were going to try and do that again or you tried to do that as your main meditation it wouldn't work because it's not really a meditation that the Buddha necessarily um um, describes to do but if it actually brought up that gratitude and love that's great and actually it could be considered as a sort of death contemplation if you were actually imagining their funeral so yeah actually that is one of the practices that we do 
Maranami Sati, reflecting on our own and other people's uh, mortality, you know, which can start with their fragility. They're not going to be here forever. You know, this life is very precious. Our relationships are incredibly precious. So how can we, I mean, it's not that we can always be with a person who we love because maybe there's some harm that they do or there's some trauma there that makes it difficult, but you can still have goodwill towards them or feel grateful for what they have been to you or for how they maybe used to be. So we can still kind of see that that kind of um, poignancy of life. And... Um, yeah, gratitude and love is a natural outcome, surprisingly, of death contemplation. Yeah, a sense of the preciousness of each moment that we have. You know, the fact that we're all here together, it's day, don't know what, but it won't last, you know, and what we're creating is something really beautiful, hopefully a safe enough container for everybody here. And that is rare, that is precious, and we don't know how long any of that will last. So that can bring sadness, but also, yeah, Sadness often does trans transform into gratitude and love, so that's very good. Yeah. And also, one more thing on the metta, which I will talk about day after tomorrow, is uh, don't worry if the feelings don't come up straight away. It's, again, kind of a process. So just like with breath meditation, you don't get PT straight away. First, you just have to work on the first two factors of jhana, which are vitaka and vichara, which means like you apply your attention and you sustain your attention on an object. And with the metta, that object is maybe the phrase of metta, if you're using phrases, or maybe the image of the person. So you apply your mind to that again and again, and you won't get the feeling straight away, because the feeling is actually coming from the mind quietening and sustaining the mindfulness. It's actually coming as that mindfulness develops. So the Buddha says in one of the suttas, Majjhima number 19, that even if you think a wholesome thought all day and night, it won't have any negative effect, except eventually you might get tired of thinking. But even just thinking beautiful thoughts keeps the mind free of aversion, free from aversion and from unwholesome thoughts. So you're actually protecting your mind and you're reconditioning it as well so that it's more likely to spontaneously have thoughts of loving kindness as you go about your life. So um, nothing's ever wasted in practice. So uh, don't worry about it. And also, when you say it's usually really hard for you, we often make these stories about our practice. You know, usually this is how it is for me, or like this is what I'm good at or not good at. This is just based on the past. Anything can happen at any time. You just don't know. The mind changes. So keep that in mind as well. Okay. And we're done for tonight. Alright. So, see you tomorrow. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for the deep questions. Some of them were really yeah. deep, juicy ones. Yeah.